This is Hans Lande. His job is to find and murder Jews. He is very good at this because he understands human psychology, is good at manipulating people, inspires fear, speaks the languages of the people he is sent among, is experienced as a detective, and is highly intelligent. This is John Smith. He is a high-ranking Nazi in the victorious Third Reich of the TV show, The Man in the High Castle. His job is to eradicate the American resistance to Nazi German occupation. He is so good at this that by the end of the show, the resistance has been utterly eradicated and the Reich is on the cusp of conquering previously Japanese-occupied West America. He is good at this job because he is smart, cunning, deceptive, patient, innovative, excellent at delegating tasks and roles, understands the psychology of his enemies and is highly skilled in the Byzantine politics of the higher echelons of the Reich. This is Agent Smith. His job is to police the Matrix by capturing or destroying any free human saboteurs sent into the Matrix and to prevent the extraction of enslaved humans from the Matrix. He is good at his job because he is ultra-aggressive, relentless and has an almost pathological hatred of humanity. This is the Grand Inquisitor. He finds facial expressions difficult. He is easily angered. He tells off subordinates as if they're pets on children rather than dealing with them. He has cool metal plates where his ears should be and uh, he has very good posture. He is also a complete moron who competes with his subordinates for praise from his superior, is unable to read the intentions and desires of those he is professionally responsible for, summarily kills valuable assets, ignores the most valuable target that he, by professional prerogative, is obligated to hunt down and destroy, and manages to get himself alone in a large dark room with a vindictive, violent, short-tempered, murderous, ambitious careerist who would like nothing better than to kill him and take his position. Now the question is, why would Lord Vader, a Sith master of brilliant strategic and tactical acumen, choose such a dangerously incompetent man as the Head Inquisitor? This chump has been given the responsibility of building and leading an intelligence and assassination network tasked with finding and killing the remaining Jedi, who the Empire rightly regards as the single greatest threat to their continued dominance of the galaxy. Let's take a look at the on-the-job performance of the Grand Inquisitor. In Episode 1, the Inquisitor responds to a rumour that a Jedi is hiding in some wretched pisspot of a desert backwater on Tatooine. The Grand Inquisitor arrives with his thugs, and literally within 15 minutes he has managed to earn the enmity of the local population. He doesn't send in any Empire assets to embed themselves in the local population and gather intelligence. He doesn't try to recruit informants by offering bribes, threatening family members, gathering blackmail on potentially useful snitches. He doesn't try to entice local officials and gangsters to flush out hiding enemies in exchange for local Imperial political support. He doesn't attempt to identify genuinely loyal individuals or organizations within the local population who may prove invaluable to him. All of which he could have done without giving up his presence on the planet. No, he just shows up with some very scary looking inquisitors and starts terrorizing the locals and demanding answers. His actions seemingly based on the vague rumor of a Jedi having been in a bar recently. And this in an area where Obi-Wan Kenobi could potentially be hiding. Does the Grand Inquisitor not think that this strategy might scare off any potential targets? That it might turn him into a target himself or turn the local population against him? or be a useful recruitment event for any Jedis that are hiding in the area. Apparently none of this occurs to the Grand Inquisitor. One would assume, based on, you know, logic, that the Grand Inquisitor would be one of the most skilled masters of intelligence, subterfuge, spycraft and terrorism in the Empire. But no. He approaches his target with the subtlety of an inebriated marine charging into his first combat situation. What news of the Outer Rim? I heard a rumor from a drunk, depressed alcoholic that a Jedi is hiding in a bar in some shithole backwater village on Tatooine. The Grand Inquisitor's next bafflingly incompetent decision is to actively oppose the search for Obi-Wan Kenobi. Yes, really. This policy is to logic what antimatter is to matter. This policy is utterly incongruous with the stated goals of the Empire. Darth Vader himself is later seen to be insistent that Obi-Wan is alive and must be found. And yet here, Vader's own Grand Inquisitor opposes the search for Obi-Wan and without any coherent reason. Isn't it the Grand Inquisitor's job to find missing Jedi? Isn't that the whole intended function of his office and the sole reason for its very existence? 
By refusing to look for Obi-Wan, the Grand Inquisitor is advocating for his own abolition and the destruction of his own power and authority. It doesn't even qualify as stupid. Stupidity requires a level of cognizant awareness that the Grand Inquisitor fails to demonstrate here. A mentally retarded person wouldn't be described as stupid because they don't have the requisite intellectual powers that allow them to distinguish stupid from smart, and their decisions and behaviours reflect this. You must first have some level of intelligence before you can do something that can be described as stupid. And the Grand Inquisitor's policy to hunting down Obi-Wan suggests the absence of even this level of intelligence. This decision could only be made by someone who has taken complete leave of their mental faculties, or someone with a severe mental retardation, in other words, a Disney Star Wars villain. Let's take a look at what the Grand Inquisitor does with the most valuable asset that comes into his possession during the entire show, Flea. Flea was briefly in first-hand physical contact with Obi-Wan Kenobi. To be clear, Obi-Wan Kenobi is the most wanted fugitive in the Empire. The Empire has not seen or heard from Obi-Wan in a decade. The last known person to have had any contact with him was Anakin Skywalker before their whole um, folly night. Now here, in the Grand Inquisitor's possession, is a man who saw Obi-Wan talk to him, has some idea of his state of health, his current physical abilities, and perhaps even his intentions. So, what does the Grand Inquisitor ask Flea during the interrogation? Does he find Obi-Wan? How did he find Obi-Wan? What does Obi-Wan want? Does he have any followers? Has he established another Jedi training school? Where was he hiding? Who harbored him? How much do you know? Did you conspire with him to let him escape? Has he developed any plans to counter the power of the Empire? Now, of course, Flea won't be able to answer all of these questions, but he should be able to answer some. He'll need to be thoroughly interrogated. So, how does the Inquisitor play it? Does he emulate Hans Landa and demonstrate his supreme power over Flea, slowly eroding his resistance and finally breaking him open and letting the information gush forth? Perhaps he'll take a page from John Smith's book and throw him in a cell to have any and all information tortured out of him, or capture and hold his family members, then force him to give up everything and work for the Empire until he is no longer of any use, or maybe give him a beating and throw him in a cell where he will meet another broken and injured victim of the Empire's brutality, and there, over the course of several empty hours, tell him everything. Which, of course, will all be recorded to say nothing of the fact that the fellow prisoner is a plant working for the Grand Inquisitor all along. Very devious. Or perhaps he can take a page from Agent Smith's playbook, give him drugs, wait for them to take effect, and ask him the questions you want answered. Simple, clean, and effective. So, how does the Empire's number one anti-resistance specialist deal with this highly valuable source of information? He asks him one question, then summarily kills him. Are you fucking kidding me? Given the resources available to the Empire, the Grand Inquisitor should be little short of a genius of operational tactics and psychological warfare, but he can't be that, can he? Because this isn't real Star Wars, that is, the Star Wars of Lucasfilm, LucasArts, and the vast expanded universe. No, this is Disney Star Wars, Kathleen Kennedy Star Wars. So we don't get good villains now. We don't get Moth Tarkins anymore. We don't get Darth Maul's General Grievous. We don't even get the real fucking Boba Fett. And we sure as hell don't get a convincing Grand Inquisitor. We get some bungling, cartoonishly incompetent moron who couldn't track down a feminist at a Disney Lucasfilm board meeting. The last Grand Inquisitor moronism we'll look at here is how he deals with Reva. Very early on, Reva demonstrates that she is a highly emotional, unpredictable, impulsive, power drunk, ambitious, difficult to control, angry, vaguely psychotic, murderous, sadistic, evil wrecking machine of an insolent brat, hell bent on finding Obi Wan. Any leader with a functioning brain cell would see her for what she is and make one of only two good decisions to be made. Kill her. If you fire her, she'll eventually go rogue and come after you in a fit of hate-filled revenge. Or, and this is the better option in my opinion, leave her to rot on Tatooine and tell her to go after Obi-Wan or die in the attempt. If she succeeds, you can take the credit. And if she fails, good riddance to a nasty rash on your ass. But what does the Grand Inquisitor do? Talking down to her like one would to a schoolchild. Where he, for reasons known only to himself, decides to tell her of his plan to shit-can her and take full credit for trapping and capturing Obi-Wan himself, which will inevitably result in her venomous murder instinct being redirected toward the Inquisitor himself. And this is exactly what happens when the Grand Inquisitor, in his most supreme act of stupidity, manages to get himself alone with Reva in a dark, isolated room with predictable results. How did he not know that this was likely to happen? 
Shouldn't the Grand Inquisitor be a master of psychology? His job is to track down dangerous and highly skilled fugitives. In order to do this, one must understand and predict the intentions, fears, likely actions and reactions of those fugitives. This requires a profound understanding of the human psyche, and yet the Grand Inquisitor can't even pick up on the fact that Riva hates him and wants to kill him, despite the fact that her actions and behaviour attest to a total disregard and disrespect for him as an authority figure. This psychological blindness is antithetical to effective fugitive hunting. How exactly did he get this job? Why hasn't he been fired yet? It actually reminds me of someone. I was actually looking forward to this show. I thought Disney might have learned from the sequels disaster and the recent Boba Fett debacle, but obviously not. They continue to make the same mistakes again and again. How is this even possible? Disney have more money than God, they own everything, and yet they can't even put together a script that accomplishes the most basic requirements of dramatic engagement. At this stage, Disney basically are the Empire, a gigantic, tyrannical, monolithic, soul-crushing force of supreme evil that rule over and oppress the culture. Disney have imprisoned Star Wars. If you want to picture the future of Star Wars, imagine a boot with a mouse logo on it, on a Jedi face, forever. Disney could have given us a fun, entertaining, brilliant and memorable villain with the Grand Inquisitor. Instead, we got a walking manifestation of incompetence painted over with a paper thin veneer of villainy in bright Mickey Mouse colours. Thanks for watching, subscribe and don't forget to hunt down, apprehend and eradicate the like button.